So welcome everyone. Uh, it's seven o'clock. Actually, it's one minute to go according to my watch. It must be slow. <laughs> so we're going to get started. Welcome everyone. We are so glad to have you here tonight. Um, we are talking about moon gardens tonight. And uh, Patty Jordan is going to be our, our guest speaker for the Master Gardeners. And this is a partnership with the Napa County Library. We're so happy to be partners with them. They're a great partner with us providing us a great venue that we can do once a month. We have these programs the first Thursday of every month. And I know many of you have attended before. We're glad to have you back. And for those of you that haven't attended before, um, the library is a great resource for us locally and also as a community partner. They're just wonderful to work with. For those of you that don't know Master Gardeners or um, haven't come to our programs before, I wanna tell you just a tiny bit about who we are. We're volunteers. We are managed through the University of California and the UC Master Gardeners is a program that extends throughout the whole state of California based in each county and also throughout the United States and a little bit internationally into Canada. Um, our mission for all of those programs is to extend research-based information and we are here to provide that to the home gardeners in our local communities. And so we are thrilled that you joined us today and we do this through all different sorts of resources and you can find those on our website. So to get into our topic for tonight, um, here's our agenda, and I'm now going to turn it over to Patty, who is going to speak, and we're going to uh, video mute ourselves, and if you maximize your screen, go to full screen, and then you can show um, either a small active video speaker or the hide the thumbnail video, and then that will give you the biggest screen possible. So go ahead and do that with your screen, and I'm going to... Uh, video mute us as well. Start recording. And I forgot to, we should be recording already. Yeah, we're recording. Okay, so go ahead, Patty. Okay, hey, <clears throat> welcome everybody. I'm glad you could join us tonight. The weather's starting to warm up now. We might be spending more time indoors with the AC during the day, but when you feel the effects of the fog coming in the gate and the breeze blowing up the valley, turn off that AC and step outside and enjoy the evening and all the peacefulness it has to offer. You know, it, it's occurred to me that when I shop for plants, it's usually with a goal of having a pretty collection of flowers and foliage that will be seen during the day. But what if you could also add plants that could be seen at night? You could increase the utilization of your garden by 25% or more, just depending on how late you can stay up. Also, there may be things happening in your garden that you're unaware of. Wouldn't you like to know what goes on in the dark? So tonight we're gonna to talk about how you can create an ancient nocturnal themed garden, the moon garden. This is our agenda. We're gonna start off with a little reflection on how the moon has forever been so ingrained in our thoughts. We will touch on the moon, his the moon garden's history and development in different cultures, and then learn what the typical components are in the moon garden and which plants can provide the most benefits. Lastly, we will talk about the night pollinators. I also wanted to mention here that to the best of our knowledge, all the images seen in this presentation are copyright free, public domain and or our own photos. Turn off the camera. So the moon is the Earth's most constant companion and the easiest celestial object to find in the night sky. Images of the moon's comings and goings were found etched in limestone caves in France, dating back to the Paleolithic era. Six out of the seven world continents, that's everything but Antarctica, have been known to have dedicated moon gods and goddesses. Ancient moon worshiping has been a part of their culture. The almighty moon has been the keeper of time, the conductor of the tides, the manager of plant growth, and the illuminator of the night sky. The moon continues to be the fascination, curiosity, and inspiration of artists, poets, musicians, philosophers, romantics, and scientists alike. We can see it so well, but it's so hard to get to, and we never see the dark side of the moon. So are you someone who feels an unexplainable and magical attraction to the moon and the stars? Well, you're not alone. Here are a few quotes inspired by the moon.
And if you need more convincing of how revered the moon is, take a look at this short list of the top 20 musical scores that were moon inspired by every genre possible, rock and roll, heavy metal, jazz, country, and orchestral musicians alike. Which one do you think of first? Do you know the lyrics? So although the idea of a moon garden may seem like a recent trend, the concept is not. Centuries ago in medieval China and Japan, white sand, pale rocks, and pools of water comprised moon meditation gardens. A round moon gate was a traditional architectural element functioning as a spiritual and physical entry into the garden. Its round shape represents the full moon or happiness. Napa has a great example of a moon gate at the corner of Soskal and First, the entrance to the China Point Park. The Japanese custom of moon viewing or tsukimi is a con contemplative moment of giving thanks to the seasonal beauty of nature. The custom first evolved only with the court nobles, but slowly evolved into a more public celebration with banquets by the ponds, musical performances, and poetry recitals, all dedicated to the moon. It is now celebrated mainly as a harvest festival by farmers giving thanks to mother nature for the harvest. In ancient Central and Southern Asia, where landlocked desert communities had no cooling effects from the ocean, paradise gardens were being created by diverting water to create an oasis of shade, fruit trees, fragrant flowers, and running rills of water. The word paradise has its origin in ancient Persia, meaning walled garden. And again, only the nobles were of high enough standings to find refuge in these cool, fragrant gardens during the midday heat. The Mughal emperor Babur brought these garden ideas from Persia to India. In 1639, the Matab Bagh, which means Moonlight Garden, was created for Shah Jahan, the fifth Mughal emperor of India. The garden was planted with fragrant flowers such as jasmine, narcissus, lilies, and used in the cool of the night as a place from which to view the Taj Mahal, reflected in the octagonal pool and in the river. Moonlight or moon gardens became popular in America in the 19th century, New England. One of the earliest recorded moon gardens in the United States was created in 1933 by Benjamin Poor in Massachusetts. It featured two 700 foot long borders that are each 14 feet wide and filled with white candy tuft, daffodils, lilacs, flowering almonds, foxgloves, lilies, and many other white flowered perennials and shrubs. Poor was so obsessed with a gleam of white that he invited his herd of snow white cows into his moon garden, as well as his white sheep, chickens, peacocks, pigeon, and dog. So in the 1900s, fragrant plants, as well as exotic fruits, were highly regarded, something we frequently take for granted today. Very often such plants had white blooms and only flourished in exotic foreign countries tuberose and gardenias, because of their intense and intoxicating aromas, were particularly cherished, not only by the poets, but also by the plant collectors. Only the rich aristocrats could afford having luxurious orangeries, greenhouses, ferneries, and conservatories where such temporal plants could be protected. Rich Victorians couldn't get enough of these botanical status symbols mm -hmm. as they tried to outdo one another by filling their gardens and glass houses with unique plants. This might be the reason why moon gardens were so closely related to refined luxury. So the greatest and most influential English garden designer was Gertrude Jekyll. Gertrude was originally a talented painter who turned to garden design, adding brush-like impressionistic style strokes of radiant color into the gardens when her eyesight was failing as a painter. She was one of the first of her profession to take into account the color, texture, and experience of garden as aspects of her design. Gertrude pioneered the idea of color themed in mass plantings or monochromatic gardens and popularized the informal, blousy, herbaceous borders that we associate with country cottage gardens. And as an aside, 
it was Gertrude's younger brother, Walter, who was a friend of Robert Louis Stevenson. He let him borrow the family name Jekyll for that famous novel, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So getting back to our point here, the most famous white garden, however, is likely that of Vita Sackville West. She's an English writer who lived at Sissinghurst Castle in Kent, England. Vita was inspired by Gertrude's work. And by 1950, she had filled her garden with white flowered roses, peonies, irises, hydrangeas, Japanese anemones, and many others. Vita Sackville West is now remembered above all for her idea that the garden should be a series of rooms, each planted with a particular color theme. Now we are lucky enough not to have to go to Europe exclusively to see fine examples of moon gardens. There are two examples within an hour's drive of Napa. One on the UC Davis campus. That's the Carol Shields White Flower Garden and Gazebo. It's a theme garden based on the medieval moon viewing gardens of India and Japan. The garden's named for Carol Shields, an avid gardener and the wife of Judge Peter Shields, one of the founders of UC Davis. And the second one, is in the San Francisco Botanical Gardens, Moon Viewing Garden. This garden was inspired by the Japanese custom of tsukimi, or moon viewing, like we talked about earlier. So the location of a, of a moon garden, it should be sited where it's easily accessible and where you would enjoy it the most. It can even be a spot that's viewed from a patio, a porch, or from inside the house. It doesn't have to be big, just one that's open to the moonlight and to allow moon and stargazing. So this may mean spending a few nights tracking the moonlight in your garden. Pay attention to where the moonlight floods, but also pay attention to where it casts shadows. Shadows of uniquely shaped plants can add intrigue to the moon garden. When selecting plants, remember that it's a flower garden during the day as well. So ensure your site has at least six hours of sun during the day. Also remember, that a location that is shaded from the sun during the day will also be shaded for the moon as well at night. You can light up these shady areas with plants with bright colored foliage and a little artificial light. You should include different components, include a mix of plants, hardscape and accessories. It can be as simple or as elaborate as you want, depending on your budget, space and your own creativity. So components of a moon garden. Make sure the paths can be easily navigated at night for safety. Incorporate light colored concrete or flagstone to walk on. You can use white gravel to outline the paths, or you can mix in these glow in the dark pebbles for fun. Use masses of these light colored pebbles or rocks to accentuate areas. Paint a background wall white or incorporate a white lattice trellis or other screening, which can provide support for night blooming vine. Cite a comfortable chair or bench where you can immerse yourself in the garden. Include a small table to set a cup of tea or a glass of wine. A votive candle or the solar lantern placed on the table will add subtle illumination and ambiance. Add additional reflective surfaces to emphasize the contemplative mood, such as a reflective metal gazing ball, metallic wall art, or a light colored statuary like a cherub, Buddha, Kuan Yin, or stone lantern and add supplemental lighting for illumination on overcast or moonless nights, but keep it subdued so that it won't overpower the natural light of the moon or distract the night pollinators. There are a lot of low light LED solar garden lights from gazing spheres to stakes to string lights on the market. Also battery or LED candles, lanterns. Make sure they have an on and off switch so that the night pollinators can also have complete darkness. Include elements that engage the sense of sound, such as a babbling water feature. The water can also reflect the moonlight. Add some grass or bamboo that rustles in the evening breeze. These peaceful sounds can induce relaxation. And if you have the space, you can create natural habitat that can allure crickets and frogs. You, you all may, you may already have these, but we're unaware because you haven't been outside in a while. Although the moon garden originated as a way to enjoy the garden at night during the hot summer months, by incorporating plants that flower at different stages of the year, together with plants with attractive foliage, it can continually lend itself to an attractive space throughout the year. 
And since we have such mild winters, this is very doable. It also means that you have a reason to shop for plants throughout the year. Yay. So you want to incorporate trees, shrubs, vines, and perennials, annuals, and bulbs. But also remember to add some deciduous trees and shrubs for a great interesting and architectural form. The ideal plants for a moon garden are those that reflect its light. This includes light colored flowers, which includes all the shades of white, cream, pale yellow, pale blue, pale pink, and any Remember, any dark colored flowers that are planted in this area are not gonna show at night. So plant with the light colored foliage that also reflects the moonlight, typically the gray, silver, and variegated leaves. Most importantly though, you should include the plants with exotic and luxurious fragrances, something that only royalty and the wealthy enjoyed historically. Plants are, are more heavily scented at night will attract the moths and other nighttime pollinators. So just as you would any other garden area, you want to group plants with a similar light and water requirements. Use the same varieties together in drifts of three to five for maximum impact. Larger blooms or groupings will show better in the dark than the smaller individual flowers. Choose a few primary plants rather than a lot of different varieties to keep the design from being too busy. Include vines to add vertical height. A trellis can support a climbing jasmine or moonflower for a living wall of color and fragrance. Incorporate both in-ground and container plantings. And if you're short of space, a moon garden can be made entirely of containers. Flowers for the moon garden. When it comes to white flowers for a moon garden, there are many choices, and I know I haven't covered them all. The list could go on and on and on. The plants here are organized by their bloom season. So I've got early, mid, and late bloomers. The lists begin with the smaller plants like bulbs, annuals, and progress further down to perennial shrubs, vines, and trees. And I provided both the common and botanical name for clarity because common names can, be, can vary from country to country and region to region. The botanical names are used worldwide and are established by the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature. So unless you know the botanical name, it might be hard to figure out which plant you're really referring to. Most, but not all, of these plants on the list also have a fragrance. And I'll let you know which ones are extendingly fragrant. An asterisk after the botanical name represents those flowers which actually open up during the night and close during the day. But for the most part, most flowers stay open day and night. So this, these lists are gonna be available on our website later. So you don't have to worry about copying them down right now. So again, like I said, the first few on the list are going to be spring bulbs, tubers, and rhizomes. And remember, you need to buy these in winter for the spring show. So I'll start down here with citrus. You know, all citrus blooms have a lovely fragrance, but it seems that oranges have the most richest lingering citrus scent. Neroli oil, which is distilled from the blossom of the bitter orange, is one of the most common oils used in perfu perfumery. Lilacs. You know, most common lilacs love a cold chill in the, in the winter, but there are now new species and hybrids that don't require it. They do fine in milder climates. I've got white angel at home. It's considered one of the best. They do get big, so you wanna use it as a background shrub. Mock orange. The next three all have a wonderful orange fragrance, but usually people don't realize that they're different plants. Remember what I mentioned about using just common names alone can be confusing. So that first one, the mock orange, that's a Pittosporum tabarum. It's a broadleaf evergreen shrub, gets to 13 feet and blooms April to May. Choicea ternata is actually a tender evergreen. It blooms May through June. Um, I think it's about seven feet. Yeah, and there's pictures. I've selected the pictures of the plants I chose to talk about. And the last one though, even though that's a late bloomer, I threw it in there because it's also called mock orange. That's Philadelphus louisii. It's a deciduous native shrub, gets four to eight feet and it blooms June through July. So all of those are considered mock oranges to somebody. And then there's the magnolias. You know, most the uh, northern magnolias are what we often refer to as the star or saucer magnolias. Magnolia is, is really an ancient genus of trees. 
I think Magnolia denudata, or people call it the Yulon Magnolia, was probably the first one cultivated at 4,000 years ago. And it's the parent to many other cultivars. So the mid-season bloomers seems to be the longest list. Honeysuckle. Now, although honeysuckle is really valued for its ability to cover unsightly walls and buildings, these hardy climbers have also gotten a bad reputation for getting out of control. So there are new varieties out there, and one of them is called Sensational. This is a non-invasive honeysuckle and has creamy pale yellow flowers, very fragrant. So the top of the right column has four jasmines in a row. So the common name jasmine, it covers a broad array of vines and shrubs that come from all corners of the temperate world. But the only true jasmines have the genus name jasminium in the name. So that first one, Arabian jasmine is a vining shrub. That's a true jasmine. Next one is a vine, a Chilean jasmine. Star jasmine, we're all familiar with. And the night blooming jasmine. It's a tender upright shrub with an oriental spice. It doesn't waft that easily, so you do need to get up close to enjoy it. Gardenias. Um, you know, gardenias have been known to be a bit of a challenge for gardeners. They can be picky about soil conditions. They prefer fairly acidic soil and a constant soil moisture. But there are grafted gardenias on the market today. And the rootstock is a gardenia thumbergii, which is a South African native that gets six to 15 feet tall. <laughs> this rootstock is superior, not only because it isn't finicky about too much or too little water, it's also resistant to root knot nematode. It is more expensive, but I think it's worth it because you don't need to replace your plant every two to five years. And angel trumpet, angel trumpet and devil's trumpet. They're both commonly called angel's trumpet, no matter which one you're talking about. They're both in the Solanacea family and all parts of both genera are highly toxic and could be fatal if ingested by humans, pets, or livestock. So Brugmansia range in height from six to 30 feet tall, while the Datura only get two to six feet in height. The other main visual difference is that the flowers of the Brugmansia hang down while the Datura flowers face, face upwards. Now the late bloomers. Midnight candy, I actually bought this and I set a timer to make sure I came outside at midnight to smell it. It is super sweet, super sweet. It is super tender as well. So if you're gonna grow it, make sure you can protect it in winter. Moonflower, uh, lots of friends tell me they have hard time germinating this. I experimented this year, I tried four different ways. The first three were directly sown in the ground. One only had a soaking treatment. The next one had a soaking and a nicking of um, the seed. I think the, the third one was just plopped it straight in the ground. None of those germinated, but the fourth one did. That's where I soaked the seed, I nicked the seed coat, and I put it in a little four inch pot of potting soil and put it on a heating pad. This worked. They started to grow in February more growth in June, and they flowered by August. Four o'clocks, you know, this, in my mind was always an old fashioned plant, but you know, it is really fragrant. It does die back into a tuber, but each year when it comes back, it's bigger and bigger. For some people with really wet backyards, this can be an invasive plant. So um, just know if you wanna control that, you need to make sure you dead having stopped those seeds from forming and uh, clematis. This vine likes to sit on top of a trellis, so if you want to enjoy it, you should probably try to trim it to keep it lower so you can smell its wonderful fragrance. Foliage for the moon garden. Leaves that are gray, silver, or white really reflect the moonlight. These all have some form of flowers as well, but they are definitely insignificant when compared to the foliage. They're usually removed to enhance the foliage. And in this slide, we see an example of what I said previously about grouping your plants according to the sunlight and water needs. So you wouldn't plant a lush shade loving 
hosta with a low water sun loving succulent like a deadlia. Take a look at that silver sage, the Salvia argentinia. Uh, this is really an impressive form. It gets to three feet in width, this rosette of gray green woolly leaves that just beg to be touched. This is suitable for a larger scale moon garden or maybe a centerpiece. Irrigated leaves. So the first few are more for brightening up the shady area. That'd be the hosta, the brunaria, the lungwort. But can you imagine what these patterns of leaves look like at night? I'm gonna try to show you this a little bit later. I, I tried to capture this. Uh, I absolutely adore the brunaria. It's got the silver between the veins in the leaves and nothing seems to bother it. It's also known as the false forget-me-not because the flowers really do look like forget-me-not flowers. Um, pasta, pasta and the plectranthus, they come in a really a wide variety of variegation between the whites, yellows, and uh, creams along with the green. So many species and at least the plectranthus is very easy to grow. So these are my favorites of the moon garden. They all have unusual shapes and exotic fragrances. The flowering ginger, I actually have, <laughs> I've been moving that around my yard in the ground and in a pot for 13 years trying to get it to bloom and it finally did it last year. The winning location was on the north side of the house and in a pot and uh, that's where it's gonna stay. And the moonflower, I told you about it how I tried to germinate those this year. Um, almond verbena, oh my goodness. This will get 10 to 12 feet tall, three to four feet wide. I have it sort of semi espaliered against the back fence and you can smell this wonderful almond fragrance wafting for a good 50 feet. I planted this when I was tired of um, trying to keep my lemon verbena alive. This is a lot more sturdier. And then the last one, the Nicotiana sylvestris, um, it's, a, it's one of the flowering tobaccos and it is fragrant day and night. And I'll show you a picture of it at night as well. So here are a few attempts of me trying to relate to you how well the white flowers pop at night. The day photos are on the left and the night are on the right, obviously. The first one is golden fever few. This was not a plant that I was concentrating on but during the dark hours of the night, it really showed up well. It self sows as well. This is Nicotiana alata, which gets about three to four feet tall. And they say it has a fragrance at night. Uh, I have a hard time discerning it, but at night the flowers show up like uh, floating stars. The next one is another Nicotiana. This is Sylvestris. Both the leaves and the flowers are fragrant day and night. This grows about four to five feet tall, may need staking. The leaves often are sticky. They get covered with a multitude of their tiny seeds that fall out of the mature seed capsules. That might be evident on the photo on the left, or maybe not. But at night, oh, sorry. the flowers look like miniature fireworks. Can you just see those fireworks right there just saying kaboom? <laughs> and this is the starburst aeonium. I love this showy aeonium. I don't think this is the same plant. I took a picture of day and night, but you can see that the photo on the right, uh, it, it almost gives you a black and white movie effect looking at that very variegation at night. And this is that Japanese grass, a chorus. You can get an idea how this variegated grass glows in the night and provides yet another texture. It almost resembles flowing water. Here's some foliage about five o'clock in the morning. Lamb's ears on the left. It may look to you like lamb's ears on the right too, but it's not. They are in the same family. The one on the right is a Cypress native and it's called Sideritis cypria. So in addition to the same soft, silvery, white, fuzzy gray leaves, it has a wonderful spiral chartreuse wand that holds tiny flowers. And then there's that uh, Plectranthus at night. Again, looks like a black and white movie. So here are more flowers. At night, if you want your neighbors to think you're off your rocker, try walking through your garden at night, taking pictures. So again, these are just some more of the flowers that were not particularly on my radar for a moon garden plant, but whose light colored flowers really showed up well. 
The white meadow sage and the white heliotrope were seriously constantly flowering for me. And one morning, the sun wasn't even up yet, and I found a sleeping bee in the almond verbena blossoms and a few active hummingbirds already out there trying to suck nectar from the honeysuckle. The moonflower is not going to open until the nights grow longer. So that's after summer solstice. My first blooms were in August. I was so enamored with this vine that I took a time lapse video of the flower opening, and it took exactly half an hour to untwist. And I was looking back at the video and it caught insects already exploring the insides before it was finished opening. Every night at eight o'clock, a big moth would visit the flower. So who are these night pollinators? Well, the goal of all living organiz organisms as well as plants is to produce offspring for the next generation. One way plants produce offspring is through making of fruits and seeds the production of a successful pollination. The most well-known are those who pollinate during the day, such as the bees, the hummingbirds, butterflies, as well as flies and beetles. But there are some plants whose specific pollinators fly at night. So it helps to be a light colored flower that's easy to see and have an alluring aroma to attract them in the dark of the night. So that being said, not all alluring fragrances are pleasant. The scent of the corpse flower is described as smelling like rotten flesh but hey, the flies and the beetles that pollinate it love it. Moths and butterflies are all members of the order Lepidoptera, which moths make up the vast majority of the order. It's said that for every species of butterfly on the planet, there are nine species of moths. So around the world, there's approximately 160,000 species of moths that have been cataloged, and it's theorized that there are just as many yet to be discovered. In San Francisco Bay Area, there are over 100 species. So most species of moths are nocturnal, attracted to the many late afternoon, night, and early morning, light colored, sweet smelling flowers. You know, they usually go unnoticed, except when they're flying erratically around your porch light, a street light, or other source of light during the darkness. And according to the Xerxes Society, one study found that nocturnal moths visit more plant species than the day active bees do. So that's, that's quite a feat considering the super pollinator status of the bees, highlighting the moth's importance in pollen transport. Some of the largest moths in the world belong to the sphinx or hawk moth family. They're meter to large, wingspans up to four inches, and they have thick bodies. They're often mistaken for hummingbirds because of their body size and the ability to hover while feeding. Hawk moths, have the world's largest tongues of any other moth and are able to secure nectar from even the longest floral tubes. Their favorites include the Datura and the four o'clock flowers. Sphinx moth eggs do turn into the tomato and tobacco hornworms. In this caterpillar stage, this is where the leaf damage to grapes and tomatoes are most noticed. The larvae then pupate into the soil for winter before starting the cycle again. Sphinx moths are generally minor pests. Naturally occurring parasites normally control it, and hand picking is very effective as well. So there is a National Moth Night at UC Davis. We've missed it this year. It's usually in the middle of July, where entomologists, families, and friends enjoy free educational activities. And at night, they shine a black light on a white bed sheet at about 9 p.m. to see how many different moths they can attract. So even though last year was uh, because of COVID more of just a virtual tour of the moth collection in the years previous, that experiment attracted up to seven different family members of the moth, which is pretty big. The other nocturnal pollinators are bats. Bats play an important role in the pollination of agaves and cactus in the Southwest, as well as many tropical and subtropical food crops such as bananas, avocados, figs, dates, mangoes, and peaches. They can carry a lot of pollen on their faces and fur. Bats can fly at speeds of 60 to 100 miles per hour in colonies of up to 1,000 bats. Almost all are insectivores that feed on vast numbers of night flying insects. One bat can eat more than 600 mosquitoes in a single hour or 3,000 in one night which is over half of their body weight. 
So there are 25 species of bats in California and 14 can be found in Napa County. Some are migratory. Most of the California species nest in trees, while others nest in caves and rock outcroppings. The species you'll most likely find in urban areas include the pallid bat, the big brown bat, the Yuma bat, and the Mexican free-tailed bat. These bats like to use man-made structures such as attics, barns, or bat boxes for roosting sites. Vineyard owners in California welcome bats because they eat insects that harm grapevines. These vineyard pests include grape leaf roller, the Western grape skeletonizer, the glassy wing sharpshooter, and the European grape moth. Several organizations are dedicated to saving bats and educating the public about them. It may surprise you to know that bats actually have a relatively long life, five to 30 years, depending on the species. And they're among the slowest reproducers for their size of any mammal. So the little brown bat, for example, the most frequent user of artificial bat habitats can live for 30 years with a female giving birth to just one pup a year. And in most cases, bats don't cause problems for residents or gardeners. And because of their nocturnal habitats, you rarely see them. So now we haven't missed bat week. That's coming up in the end of October. That's an annual international celebration of the role of bats in nature. So in conclusion, we have talked about man's lifelong fascination with the moon and how that's not likely gonna change based on the plethora of dedicated poetry, songs, and continued scientific exploration of its secrets. We've uncovered the origins of moon garden, white garden, and how different parts of the world contributed to its elements of water, fragrance, and white flowers. We've listed all the typical elements of a moon garden, not to dissuade you from incorporating your own unique elements that enhance the garden experience. We have found out who the night pollinators are. So our next full moon is August 22nd. Mark your calendars for a night walk through your yard. Decide the perfect place for moon viewing. See which plants you already have that seem to glow in the night. Look through our list of seasonal bloomers and make sure you have some from each season. You will need to add these plants when they become available at the nursery. So that's generally when they're blooming. And don't forget to shop for spring bulbs in winter. Now's a good time to tell you that there's another Master Gardener event coming up. Uh, that's the Meditation Garden Library Talk. That's November 4th. So this is a list of our resources for both the flowers and the moth and the bat information. Again, this is gonna be posted on our website later for you. And I just wanted to mention at the bottom of the moth and bat resources, we've got Corky Quirk. Now he's, he's a regional expert, he's in UC Davis. Uh, he founded the NorCal Bats, which is dedicated to the rescue, rehabilitation and release of bats throughout the NorCal community and he's committed to the public education of bats. You'll find this information as well as information from all of our other events posted at our website. Are there any questions? Let's see. I don't see any questions no, typed no, in. Okay. So while we're waiting, I'll just let you know that uh, for those of you who attended tonight's library talk, there will be some seed packets of moonflower, woodland tobacco, and white flower four o'clocks outside the library on Saturday between 12 and 1230 near the steps. But you have to utter this secret word, moon garden. So that's this Saturday on Saturday, August 7th. And we have one more thing to tell you about Master Gardeners. If you're interested in becoming a Master Gardener, we actually are taking applications right now. Starting the end of this month, we'll be having information meetings and that's where you can get an application for the program. If you go to our website and look under um, new volunteer training or volunteer training, you'll find it right on the front page there. That'll give you information about our upcoming meetings and um, other information. So thank you so much. Um, our presentation for next month is going to be on um, native bees and the pollinators they love. So we hope you'll join us. I can't believe there's no questions. We just had so much information, I guess. Mm -hmm.
So I see a lot of thank yous in the chat, but no other questions coming up. Good. Someone can't wait for the next full moon. Looks like they're going to start planning one. All right. Well, I guess we'll let you all go then. You get to an early break tonight. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and as Patty said, this presentation, as well as all the resource pages, will be posted on our website. It usually takes us a couple of days to do that, so don't expect it to be there tomorrow, but it will be up by the, probably by the end of next week. You'll be able to go back and review this. You can check back on, on the plant list and all the other information that's available on Moon Gardens. And thank you for coming tonight. Bye, everybody. Yeah.